have attempted to find God in a new and meaningful way, or even discern that there is no God. And part of that issue for many of us is dealing with the term Jesus and God. We want to create it into something else because of some of the abuse that we may have felt, perceived, seen, based on what people do all in the name of God. All in the name of God. It's like me saying to you, we're the frequency of love. That's what we are. And then one of you deciding that to show that frequency of love, we would rob from the rich and give to the poor. Well, Reverend Cherie said to do that. No, 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 no. Hear that? No. No, she did not. But how can we then blame God for what man has decided to do? But we do it. We do it anyway. So today's talk is to become a mystic. The term mystic means someone who is seeking to unify with a deity through contemplation and self-surrender. That's what a mystic is. So today our talk is to become a mystic. And we're going to look at it through integral Christianity. Integral Christianity. Integral means what is necessary to make whole. What is necessary to make whole. And the first term that really came to light recently has been Ken Wilber's book, Integral Spirituality. And from that, Reverend Paul Smith wrote a book, Integral Christianity. Now, Reverend Paul Smith was one of the keynote speakers at Unity's convention this summer in June. And it was a great, inspiring speech. His background is he's a Baptist minister. Some of you may go, mm -hmm. tune out now. <laughs> tune out. So I'm going to invite you to stay here, to stay present with me just a little while longer. Because even though he is a Baptist minister, he has worked on his own evolution of consciousness, friends. Okay? He's worked on his own evolution of consciousness. He's taught, yes, at the Baptist Seminary. He's taught at St. Paul's Seminary. He's also taught at Unity Seminary. Okay? So that's who he is in a short synopsis. What I really liked about it was, in Unity, even though we say that our foundation is Christianity, there is a huge contingency that is anti-Christology. If you go to the Unity Village right now, when I was in seminary, there was a big brouhaha over them removing the sign that said School of Christianity. They removed it because who was in power at that time felt that that was not applicable, that we were not based on a Christian foundation. And I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you and say that we are. <laughs> at least that's my thinking. Doesn't mean that's true. But that's what I think. Now I'm saying it not from the perspective of Jesus as our Savior, meaning that we were born into original sin and we need Jesus to save us. I am saying it from the perspective of Jesus is our way shower. And yes, our Savior from the perspective of we're our own saviors. And he showed us how to do that. Do you understand the difference there? There's a big nuance there. So, one of the things, I left my clicker down there, that Reverend Paul talked about was what was Jesus' relationship with God? Okay, so he said, Jesus spoke to God, Jesus spoke about God, and Jesus spoke as God. And here's the piece that is often forgotten. 
Jesus also said, so can you. So can you. So in that relationship that Jesus had with God, it's multifaceted. So for him, Jesus felt God was infinite, not limited. He was a big God. He also had an intimate relationship with God in that he used the term Abba, which is an Arabic term for father. Now, Reverend Paul states that Jesus used that term to talk about the corporate father, that he was using it as a mother-father type of term. I'm not so sure about that because I'm thinking, back then, Jesus was a Jew, right? We know that. And it was a very patriarchal society. So I have mixed feelings about that, but I'm just telling you what he relayed. That he saw it more as an embodiment of Mother, Father, God. He also said that Jesus spoke as God. So if you see me, you see God. If you follow me, you follow God. So we talked previously once before about the three faces of God. The three faces of God. And that's the type of relationship that he's talking about here. Now keep in mind in the beginning of Christianity, they were just individual people following Jesus. And after Jesus left, what happens is it was much more of a trance-like worship. It was experiential. It was an experiential relationship. And you can find, for example, in the book of Acts, that trance is spoken to and of several times. Peter, the apostle, went into a trance, saw, had a conversation with Jesus. The author of the Gospel of John, constantly in a trance state as he wrote. So they were having these mystical experiences of God of Jesus. It wasn't about creed. This was not about a belief system. As Reverend Paul says, this is not a belief system. This is a series of realizations which awaken us to a new level, a state of transcendent consciousness in which we experience oneness with God. Which we experience oneness with God. He also had this wonderful quote, the eye with which I see God is the eye in which God sees me. The eye in which I see God is the eye in which God sees me. You're talking about oneness. Now in unity, we talk about oneness an awful lot. But do we actually practice oneness? Do we have those mystical experiences where we connect with God in oneness? Paul, Reverend Paul was saying that Christianity for him is about accepting the gift of friendship of Jesus. That's his term. That's his understanding of Christianity. Now when I went into seminary, I thought it was a given that we would all understand the concept of Jesus. So to my shock and surprise and interest, there was a large group that didn't believe Jesus even existed. And so it was just kind of interesting to allow this process while also checking my level of consciousness and what do I really believe. So that's the gift that you get when you go to seminary. You get to examine deep what you really believe. And why do you believe that? So for me, I'll share an experience with you that I really don't share that often, and it's one in where I was a child. Oh, you're here. Hi. <laughs> where I was a child, and I came from a family that was pretty abusive with each other. So I'm between the ages of five and nine, I remember my parents fighting physically. There were instances where I was so scared I ran out into the street screaming. I remember another incident where I would put my body to and push my brother into the corner to block him so that nothing could happen to him. 
they were violent with each other. And at night time was when it would really get pretty loud. And I remember very clearly that um, my mom said, and if I'm lying, may God strike my children dead. Oh. And then my father said the same thing. And of course he was on the opposite side of the issue. Stark terror. Stark terror. And I remember that I would leave my body frequently. I would leave. Now I realize later it's astral projection. But I would leave and I would go to the safe space. And as I traveled, I spoke with Jesus. I had a real connection. I felt loved. I felt comforted. I kept saying, let me stay. And I kept getting the message, no, you'll be okay. You need to go back. Each and every time. So for me, having mystical experiences affirms my belief. For me, this is real. Now, it may not be for you, and that's okay. But here's the thing about integral Christianity. It's an and situation. It's not an only situation. See the difference. In fundamental or traditional Christianity, there are certain beliefs that you must have in order to call yourself a Baptist, a Lutheran, a Methodist, etc. Integral Christianity says, let's bring it all in. And I have to tell you that I think Charles and Myrtle Fillmore were doing this ooh, a long time ago. We remember Charles going out and bringing in the meditation, bringing in the Eastern philosophy, right? Myrtle bringing in the prayer and the healing and the mystical experiences. They were doing this way back when. But now we call it integral Christianity. <laughs> So how do we do, have a mystical experience if we want to have one? And Reverend Paul put five steps, and he calls it sitting with Jesus. Now, it doesn't have to be sitting with Jesus. It's just the framework that I'm using today as I talk about Jesus. But it can be sitting with the divine feminine. It can be sitting with your guides. It can be sitting with Krishna. It can be sitting with Buddha. It doesn't matter. Hear me. It doesn't matter. In one incident when um, Reverend Paul was talking, he spoke of this woman who wanted to follow Jesus, and as she was thinking about that, she had a mystical experience where Krishna showed up at the end of, edge of her bed. You know, and she's like, well, can I be both? His response was, yes! Yes, you can! We can be anything we want. There are no rules of how we have our relationship with the divine. There are no rules. So I'm going to use Jesus here, but you can use whatever works for you. So his first step, he says, is about welcoming Jesus and thanking Jesus for being with them. Well, what do we do when we have people over? What do we do? We welcome them, right? I'm so glad that you're here. Show them around our home. Absolutely. Offer them water. Thank you for the gifts. Offer them food. Right? So if you're talking about unifying with the divine, then you welcome the divine in your space. With me? I'm sorry? With me? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and so it's just a moment of being grateful for this experience, for this entity being with you. The second step is about connecting heart to heart, about falling in love with the entity, the deity that you are communing with. So falling, allowing yourself to be open-hearted to whether it's Jesus or God or Krishna. Open and welcoming. Because when we fall in love, what it does is it moves that deity or that person from mythology or from historical figure or whatever to a living presence. To a living presence. 
So he said, this is beyond logic. He calls it trans-rational. Beyond logic. So this is where the intellect, my friends here at Lawrence, very intelligent folks, we need to separate out a little bit. We're talking about a mythical experience. And then, he says, to sit quietly in the field of love. And so this is about enjoying the moment. Being in that now moment with the divine. And just enjoying that. And then he spoke about allowing the communications to flow back and forth. And in this, this is allowing all of your senses and your being to be present. Because maybe you'll get pictures in your head, or colors, or maybe there'll be smells that will occur. Or maybe you'll feel a physical touch, or a wind against your hair, or your ear, or something like that. You just want to have all of yourself open and available to that communication. And then lastly is rest Rest in the oneness. Rest in and as an infinite being. Because once you become that connected and unified with the divine, you can't help but know yourself as infinite as well. So it transcends. So what we're going to do is, when Celia comes up, please, um, she'll prepare us for meditation. Please come up. Yeah, thank you. That wasn't clear. <laughs> um, so prepare us for meditation, and then I'm going to actually walk you through those five steps in meditation today. Next week, I will not be here. <laughs> hey, was that a happy dance? That was a happy dance. Um, Reverend Mark Fuss will be here. He'll be giving the message next week, and he is from Unity Village. He is known as the Outreach Director of Outreach is his title. Um, and he actually used to be the recruiter for Unity Seminary. So he knows that every, every minister is kind of fun. Um, he's a real sweet man. You'll enjoy him. And then I'll be back the next Sunday. <laughs>